Hi friends, it's Deanna Williston from Our Blooming Catholic Life, and I am back from vacation. I know I normally film on vacation, but I was so entered in present to the vacation with my husband that I did not film at all. But I did think of you plenty of times and of great things that we could explore and learn about together. And one of them was this. Have you ever heard of the German invasion into Western North Carolina? I'll get to this in a second because what I started out with was um, on vacation in Tennessee, we were in the Smoky Mountains and we stopped at the Moon Pie Book Warehouse, um, which we thought was going to be all like old books, out of print books, awkward books that didn't sell. Like we thought it was just going to be, you know, something kind of silly. And it was a wonderful bookstore, huge selection of Bibles and Bible cases. Um, plenty of great books as well as moon pies. I don't know a lot about moon pies. <laughs> kind of avoided that section. But um, what we spent a lot of time in, I did, which is funny, um, I spent a good deal of time in the local authors section. Um, so that's normally my husband's thing is to be in the history section. And there I was in the local fiction section. Um, this one was called A Short Time to Stay Here by Terry Roberts. And it is a novel, won a big award. Um, let me read to you from the back to get you just as excited as I was to read this. Vital, absorbing novel. And that is Elizabeth Spencer, author of The Voice at the Back Door and Light in the Piazza. Thrilling story of the clash of cultures, of mystery, espionage, revenge, and love. A riveting story bringing to life a particular Appalachian time and place by one of the exciting new voices of Southern fiction. Robert Morgan, author of Gap Creek and Brave Enemies. And I'm like, Southern fiction? Is that a thing? What, like, what, do you, that's a genre? Roberts brings to life the historical circumstances and much more. Doris Betts, author of Souls Raised from the Dead and the Sharp Teeth of Love. Wait, this is historical? <laughs> so much to like. The village itself stretched out alongside the French Broad River. Its famous hotel now used to house German civilians during wartime. The man in charge with as many decisions to be made, the woman he meets, and how, page by page, month by month, they fall in love. John L., author of The Winter People and The Journey of August King. That review kind of had me, because, okay, so it's seeing actual geographical things nearby. You know, the French Broad River. Famous hotel, now housed to serve... No, now being used to house German civilians during wartime. What? There was a German internment camp in, in America? And then... The man in charge, and then you're reading the woman. Okay, so this is like a romance novel. Yikes, what am I getting into? I don't normally end up reading those books very much. Went on to the next one, though. Brilliantly plotted and rendered in a style both lyrical and concretely realistic. Flawless in characterization with an authoritative command of the history that enfolds it. Jerry Lee Leith Mills editor emeritus of studies in philosophy. Such a broad range of reviewers. This book is by Turner Publishing Company. Again, even a publishing company I know nothing about. Let me try and fix this here. My little hoodie. It's it's Saint Nick reminding you to take care of the poor. <laughs> He's like, yo, yo, take care of the poor. Um, <laughs> the back has a little little short bit on it, a little summary. War changes everything that should have been in the summer of 1917. Oh wait, this isn't even World War II. The United States enters World War I and Stephen Robbins' beloved Mountain Park Hotel is pressed into service as an internment camp for over 2,000 German nationals, including Hans Rooster and his men. Feisty Anna Ullman, seeking independence in a male-dominated world, flees south from New York to devote her life to documentary photography in beautiful Hot Springs, North Carolina. And here I'd like to stop and thank um, Elizabeth and Sarah, my young friends, who one year asked me, um, to teach a course in, in, on literary things. It was supposed to be a great books course, but I ended up with only two students, so we couldn't really use great books methodology. So we kind of explored it on our own, and we did look at women authors of this time and period. And it is a time and period where a lot of women got married because society forced them to, and they felt very confined. Um, and just really need to break free of their husbands. And so it's like, oh, it's exploring that angle period of time as well. Interesting. 
Haunted by demons past and present, they face heartbreaking tragedy, yet together they will discover the true meaning of imprisonment and escape. And so the historicity of this book is what lured me in. I was definitely leery, leery of the romance novel aspect. Um, we all know I tried to read a book on Korean history during um, World War II, and that book, it, it went downhill very fast, and um, we never finished reading Pachinko, although that was highly acclaimed as well. This one had a big seal, and sometimes that's the kiss of death for me, that sometimes to make a book super popular, you have to go into a lot of sex and tawdriness, and this book proved you do not. <laughs> I actually read it cover to cover and had enough time to run out and get the history book that goes with it. We'll get to that again in a second. So a short time to stay here, a novel. So it's letting you write right, no, right away. This is not straight up um, a history book. And, and, and I did struggle a little bit trying to figure that out. Um, so the copyright of this book was 2012 and 2016. Okay, so it's fairly new. Printed in the U.S., Memory of My Father. And then it has a nice little map to kind of get you used to the area, which is nice. Um, and that map is from 1917. And it has a little quote, Little birdie, little birdie, come and sing to me your song. Give a short time to stay here and a long time to be gone. And that says that's a traditional quote. Doesn't say traditional from where, but I'm guessing from the South in that area. Maybe it's something she heard growing up. Let me read you just a tiny, tiny bit of um, chapter one, and then we'll get into it. Of course I couldn't sleep. I'm a barren, haunted sleeper under the best of circumstances. And these circumstances were very contrary, even for me, a man made of contradictions. That was the first night that we held all 2,370 aliens behind the wire, some 600 of them under the roof of the mountain park itself. I was comatose by 9 o'clock, collapsed in my own sweaty clothes across my bed, but clear-headed by the dark middle watch. At 2, I gave up sleep entirely, stripped, took a brief cold sponge bath, and put on my dressing gown over trousers. Then I did what I was accustomed to do in earlier, finer days. I walked the dark halls, all but invisible myself, I strolled back and forth on each long hallway, nodding to the guards at each lamplit end, stopping to listen and to watch. How were they different? I kept asking myself. These Germans, how different from the rich patrons we had served before the war? And how were we to serve them now, in cages as they were behind our newly constructed fence? I lived then on the top floor of the Mountain Park Hotel, and had done so for seven years since Major Jack Rumball installed me as the manager. Lived by myself in a double suite of rooms, 305, 306, up under the beautiful steep mansard roof, meaning that I dressed and bathed and slept and drank there. I usually lived my life across three floors, through all 300 plus guest rooms, the offices, the cavernous ballroom, the gracious dining room, the lobby with its potted plants and rich leather bound chairs, the deep delved basements, the high narrow attics under the groaning roofs, the mile or so of porches, both glassed and open, the several miles more of hallways with their chestnut chair rail and the fine Scottish rose details. When it breathed, the mountain park, I breathed. When I talked, it talked. And it's just lovely. It draws you in right there. I am sorry about switching into that accent, especially if it offends someone. Um, I tend to pick up accents when I go somewhere or I'm around someone with an accent. It's a really awkward thing I do. Um, and I have not quite lost a little bit of that southern accent yet. We have only been home a day or two. So it is still comes and goes every now and then. But this book does. It draws you in and you feel as though you're there living with these mountain folk. And can you imagine being in a rural area? So this mountain park hotel, it is not like visiting the Smoky Mountains now where there's a big lodge and a big rural area. So this was literally, it was hot springs. It started out as warm springs and then they found a hotter spring and they renamed it hot springs. <laughs> and they built this big hotel and rich people could come and visit the hot springs and you know get the health benefits. And it did not do well in the time right before the war because things were getting hard. So it was already not doing well and the government approached them or they approached them. I don't know how it happened, but they ended up housing these German citizens. A lot of them had served on ships 
So they were merchant marines or they ran a cruise line. Um, one of them was, was a band and they got caught out of country when the war started. What are you going to do? So wherever they were, they had to get shipped somewhere. And originally they were in small groups and they ended up consolidating them. And there was this big mountain hotel. It's in the middle of nowhere, so they aren't going to do any harm, right? So you could do it. They put up the big fence. They built the 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 officers got to stay in the big fancy hotel, and the common men built in a camp on the other side and barracks. They built up quick, and so the mountain people had to interact with them. They had to interact with the mountain people. They're from different cultures. Most of the people there, I think in the time, were probably Scotch-Irish. Don't quote me on that. And so here are some Germans. So a different little bit of culture there, as well as the Scotch-Irish had grown up in America, the way of the mountain culture. Um, those are poor, hard scrabble mountains. They are not real good for farming, but you can farm out a living there. Um, and and there they were and then they were with some really high class Germans and some average soldiers and how did it work out and so I read this book this book was lovely it did have a love scene it was not it was not anything obscene <laughs> um, and it took you through like what happens when you've got this camp and now you're friends with the townsfolk right and then some of the bodies of the young men from the town who'd gone off to war some of those bodies come back those young men had been killed in the war, possibly by people known by people in that camp right there. How does that work? How do you keep peace of that many men inside a barbed wire fence? And this book is amazing. I can pick a section later on um, at 197. When the sleepy guard let me out of the gate, I hesitated. Walked halfway across Bridge Street towards Camp A Gatehouse, the gate that would take me back to Mountain Park and perhaps to rest. When I stopped in the middle of the road, I experienced a sudden rush, an overwhelming sense of what I had felt so often as a child and a young man. Simply, it was the pool, the long road. I felt that I could walk 50 yards to the skeleton of Robert Snyder's half-finished bridge, cross the thin ribbon of steel girders onto the turnpike, then north or south, simply turn suddenly and instinctively one way or the other and be gone by morning disappear completely out of the lives of the Germans and the people of Hot Springs whose destinies were knitted into mine, perhaps leaving a torn place in the fabric of their lives, perhaps not. Um, here's another little bit. Sorry, that didn't even talk about the Germans, so I'm going to come over to page 199. He was talking to the Commodore, that is Hans Rooser, that afternoon in his new Heidelberg chalet. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. Stick with me, folks. This is really worth seeing. I refused his offer of tea and served him instead apple brandy made by my friends, the Ramses. There was a little sturdy blaze in his meticulously constructed brick stove. And from a pot on top, Rooster served King James, that's a big old dog, a bowl of something that looked like mush but smelled like bacon. Whatever it was, the king happily lapped it up. After we had sipped our brandy appreciatively for a few minutes, he said evenly, so two are gone and one remains. I nodded. Two gone to Fort Oglethorpe, not gone from the world. He chuckled. I never thought you capable of executing them. You should have let me take care of that. Sorry, the German has a southern accent in this. <laughs> but then perhaps, I can't do it. You are saving young Sonic for something especially gruesome. This is a part of the chapter where perhaps people inside the camp have done things. Uh, some of those in turn there have, have not followed the leadership. And they had to figure out what to do with them. Now, if you if you would treat them badly, that could go badly. It could get in the press and then go badly for the soldiers in the war, for the American soldiers. If you treat them too cushy, these people in turn, well, your own people are going to turn on you, right? Because they're here. These are prisoners. They are alien citizens. And they are being treated better than the people local, right? This is a very poor area. And so it is a very delicate balance. And I, I would not wish to be those men. So in this, in this fictionalized version, they had sent two men off uh, to, to another fort to be imprisoned for their crimes. Uh, it was my turn to laugh. No, no, I'm saving her Sonic because I don't know, know what to do with him. He is the dangerous one, I think. Rooster nodded, sipping his brandy. 
as he bent his face appreciatively over his cup. I could see etched there all his seventy plus years, the long journey that must have been his life, staring into a thousand moons and a thousand suns. What is the ribbon, Commodore? I asked, seeking for his sake to change the subject. The ribbon on your lapel. He touched with his forefinger the faded ribbon I referred to, mostly gray now, descended from black and white it must have once been. He always seemed to wear it, and so I thought it signified something he was proud of. It is, you might say, the order of the fatherland. It is an honor. With it came a medal for distinguished service, I guessed. No, he smiled. We Germans assume service. It is for bravery. The medal is an iron cross, like the infamous ones in your war posters. How did you earn it, I asked, hoping still to take him far away from his cold mountain prison, if only in his memory. When I was a young man, Stephen, I was in the Imperial Navy. This is a secret, I am telling you, because I have never admitted it to your authorities. A young officer struggling to find his advancement, and during our war with France in 1871, I saved a man from drowning, simply because I was there blockaded in port, and I could swim. It could have been any man, he shrugged. The sea makes no distinction between one and another, and I did not know until I had brought him up to the boat that he was my enemy, my opponent in the service another young officer who happened to be the prince of a royal family. And so this book explores what makes us of different cultures, what really divides us. And the, the book delves into it in a, a unique way because it, it can, because this happened, this clash of cultures. The Germans invaded Western North Carolina. And what we have here, and it's revealed in this book, it talks about a young woman coming from New York to document the life. But there were actually people who did that. One of them was a German and that is featured in this book. Um, but there are other people as well, and the newspapers covered it. And these photographs still exist. They are in a museum, um, but they are kept away. The, the originals don't get seen. So once I read this one, we went back. I was sure that that Moon Pie Book Warehouse was going to have the actual history book, and we did find it. So this book is referenced here. And so I did find it, or if it wasn't referenced, I found it on the internet pretty quickly. I said I need it, and it is a pictorial history. This book is The German Invasion of Western North Carolina, a pictorial history by Jacqueline Bergen Painter, and it is copyrighted in 1992, reprinted in 1997 by the Over Mountain Press in Johnson City, Tennessee. Any damage is mine from the hot tub. I'm sorry to have done it, but I am not ashamed. Um, there's a lot of credits and acknowledgments. Of course, you can imagine because there are people who had all these photographs still. Um, and there was also some books that were published in Germany in the 70s. There's a lot going on. So there's a foreword, an introduction. Chapter one is a picture's worth. Two, the healing water. Three, uninvited guests. Four, all is not well. Five, that ancient aura. Six, as others see us. 7. Auf Wiedersehen 8. The Foeman's Merit 9. The Name on the Cross 10. Unwearied Aspirations Source Notes Credits and Acknowledgements Appendixes and Indexes Woo! And the book is dedicated to three special octogenarians my mother, my aunt Eileen, and my uncle Sid. And you can see it is very easy to read this table of contents. While there is a long bit between the title and the number they have those dash dash dashes. And so you will find it easy. Um, it gives you the history. It uses some of the postcards as well from the hotel. That's why they have the print on. If they had the print on, they are probably a postcard. You can see it's a lovely place. It was quite a grand place to stay. Beautiful river. And anybody would love to stay there. And it does say the even before then it was not completely isolated before 1917. Um, in 1820s there was a turnpike and later a railroad that connected the village to the outside world. With the construction of the Warm Springs Hotel before the Civil War, it became a, a nationally renowned spa and it attracted visitors from afar. It will tell you at some point all the famous people who have been there. But the national reputation and the hotel's need for business led the federal government to locate a camp on the hotel grounds for German civilians who were interned during the war. It's important to know that they were civilians. Several guarded compounds were constructed to hold about 2,200 prisoners. The families that were already resident in the United States flocked to the town of Hot Springs to be near them. 
The proximity of so many Germans in the small village led to many personal contacts between them and their village. Some local people opened their homes to relatives of the internees. The guards would take prisoners home for dinner. The Germans, in turn, taught many crafts to townspeople and entertained them with band music. Most importantly, the villagers came to see the human side of the people with whom the nation was at war. And it is very interesting because that goes back and forth at time. They made they were leery of them, they made friends with them, and then as the bodies came back, then sentiments changed and they had to be moved. But as time goes on, those wounds, those wounds get addressed, they get reopened, they get healed. Um, it is it is very interesting. There is still there is a road sign marker to guide you. Chapter one. This picture is what did a lot of the research. So that is afterwards. Let's see if it says that is 1932. That is the German ambassador, and he is placing a wreath on the graves of these men who died. Unfortunately, when right at the end of their time there, um, there was some contamination of the water, and the men got sick, and a small number of them died, and they were buried there in the local cemetery. They had purchased that. Now there was a young woman in 1933, so that, that picture was taken, 1932. She was, it was pictured in the Berlin Radio Magazine, a large tombstone at Asheville, North America. It listed 18 German seamen who had died and been buried there during the Great War. And you can see these little crosses have names on them, but only one is really visible, that it's really easily readable. Now this woman, she gasped. That was her brother. They never knew. I tear up every time. They never knew what happened to him because he was not a soldier, but he disappeared during the war. They never knew what happened to him. And and there it was his grave. And she wrote to them and she said, uh, she sent them, wait, does it tell you? It's, it's very cute, the address she sent to them. She sent it to the American Legion, Asheville, Nord America. And it was received by the former co commander of the Kiffin Rockwell Legion post in Asheville, North Carolina. And it got translated from the German by someone else also of Asheville. She told them a little bit about her brother and said, Could you please tell me anything about what happened to him? And it started a friendship that went back and forth into the beginning of almost the next world war. And, and it is a lovely pictorial book, but what I want to show you, there was a golf course on, on the hotel grounds. It shows you the family that had built it, the different fortunes of the family. It shows you how gorgeous it was inside this hotel. Again, this is where the officers stayed. Um, the crewmen got barracks, and they were taking pictures. Of them they would line them up but there were some some candid photos in here as well there are photos here of the ships that they were on some of them were on some luxury liners um, so the the, the crewman's barracks were very simple where they were staying i want to show you what they started to do to keep themselves busy they built themselves a tiny german village you can't quite see it all uh, me holding it up but it is amazing. So there had been a flood in the area. Oh wait, here's the, the band. There had been a flood in the area a few years before. And so there was driftwood all about from the, the flood. And so these men took that. They took that driftwood and old tin cans that they pressed down. And they built themselves a new village on the grounds of the hotel. It is quite amazing. They did some other things to keep busy. Um, one young man was a painter. Some could do some needlework, carving. And they did things for various members of the community as well as themselves. Um, and this picture book will tell you, it really takes you in there. Each side did have a church. One of the structures was actually double story. And I think they, they could stay in there a good part of the year. It gets them out of the barracks. They're still inside their fence. They're still contained. But they could live a life that was human. That was humane during a time of war. And although they were enemies, um, these, these were civilians. They did dearly love their country, but they were civilians. I'm not going to show you because I do want you to read the book. There is an alligator <laughs> that they carved. It is one of the funniest bits that they had done. 
And this book will take you through. They did they did a lot of interesting things too. The pool had been flooded from that flood, right? All filled up with mud. So they cleaned it out, made themselves a pool. So they were industrious, they kept busy. Um, you hear about the YMCA setting up so they could take classes. Anything to keep them busy. And you would think, well, that's keeping them, again, treating them better than the local citizens. But you, this is 2,000 men in a town that I think had like 650 to start with. And so you needed to keep them busy and happy. Um, and all their mail, they had mail that came and went. But their mail that came and went um, was censored. The book ends on page 84, but then it keeps going. 86 starts the sources, and they are all listed out. There's a lot here, so the sources are listed out by page number. They are all listed out. Um, and then Appendix 1 starts on page 88, and it is selected records of prisoners. They don't have all 2,200, but they tell you. They put a human face on it. They show you the records. There's the interview, the transcript of the interview by the Immigration Service in the United States. There's some pictures in here. Um, and that does go on for quite a while. Um, so there's copies of telegrams, topi copies of letters, copies of photographs. The, the list is on page 116 of those who were buried in that cemetery. There is a map. Um, of Germany, showing some of the battles of that war. Pre-war photos of the Hamburg American luxury liners. So they're showing you the ships that a lot of them served on. And it's very elegant. Oh, they include the dinner menu. So you could see it really was fancy. The officers were used. They were not used to the rough life of military. They were used to serving on a ship. There is an index back on 126 and a pictorial index on 127 and then that ends the book. To say that this is a generously illustrated history does not begin to describe it. That's what they say in the back, the generously illustrated history of the little known German internment camp located in Southern Appalachia village of Hot Springs during World War I. But it is also the story of the relationship between the mountain villagers and the German prisoners in their midst, including the crew of the world's largest ship, the Vaterland. This is a lovely book as well. I encourage you to get these. It is a time when we are talking about how people from different cultures can get along. Um, you know, we're always saying coexist. We're talking about intercultural competencies. We're talking about dialogue. Um, as well as we are talking about intolerance and internment camps and things of that nature so that this these books were very timely for me and i do think i learned a lot in them i hope you do as well that is the end of the book review god bless you friends